What's happening? Hello, how are you guys? How are hey, you? Matt. What's going on? Hold on, let me turn my video on. What's happening? Are you in the office? I'm in a co-work space. I, I cannot do remote work. <laughs> like I am not really a remote. I'm not a remote worker, so I found Work Bar, which is a co-work space here in Boston that is phenomenal. Yeah, love, you like it? Love it. And they're 25% capacity. Not only are they at that capacity, but the sanitized stations, uh, they keep everyone separated. The environmental uh, air system here is unbelievable. I'm in the Needham location. They've got 16 nice. locations in Boston. They're all wow. the same. That's and awesome. It, it's it's awesome. So I, th I think they have one in Burlington too. Is that them? There's yeah. one in Burlington. There's one in Arlington. There is uh, three downtown. Um, I'm in the Needham one. There's one in Norwood. Plus, they do partner with other co-working sites, so you can use those mm -hmm. sites as well. That's cool. Oh, cool. Yeah. So I like it. Yeah, we have a. Um, trade with work bar that you know we do stuff for them they do stuff with us so we have access to all of their spaces i haven't been since all of this though but that's not a bad idea well you know they can't, scenery. <laughs> they can't close because they're a, a postal mail stop so people get their mail here so they always are open right they, they keep them open so Are there a lot of other people there, Matt, using the space? Probably. Well, there's certain companies that have their own little office spaces in, in, in behind closed doors. Uh, there's probably like 20 companies in here, but not many people in those offices. But outside those offices, there's probably maybe 10 total. Cool. So. Yeah, I would imagine that those those types of um, communal workspaces are kind of struggling for rent right now if people have pulled out of their memberships or their contracts. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, they, they keep it pretty good. I mean, it's, I gotta say, it's, uh, it, I, I'm very happy with it. That's good. Did we lose Mackenzie? Nope, she's right there. Oh, okay. Oh, she. Can you see me? Okay. Mm -hmm. oh. oh, I think it was just because we were talking. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so I will kind of kick off the program. Quick welcome. Thank you to our sponsors. Walk through the agenda and then when it's each of your turns to present, I'll just let you share the screen with if you have slides or anything like that. We do have the meeting set up so people joining can share their camera for interaction. There's 35 people signed up. So my guess okay. is somewhere in the 20s at 10. Um, I do have a good handful of questions people submitted when they registered. So if, if those students don't bring them up themselves, I'll, I'll sprinkle questions in. But I think it makes the most sense that if people have questions about resume stuff, let's answer it in that part of the workshop rather than, you know, go back. Um, so planning each part to be, and you know, anywhere 20, 25 minutes, whatever feels right. Um, and then we'll have the opportunity if students would like to do virtual speed networking after. That's been a lot of fun at some of our programs. It would require people would leave Zoom and go to our hop-in. Um, so I'll just let people know how to access that after this event. Okay. Um, Is that so, something yeah, we we should join as well or what's your preference you're welcome to um you're you're absolutely welcome to it's totally up to you more of like a, a timing constraint if you'd like to do that i have it set up to stay open until five o'clock assuming we get there sometime between 4 20 4 30 there yeah. are four minute conversations max so even if people do it and that you know they meet five or six people um so it's totally up to you all you do is it's a, a web browser link i'll share You'll have to make a, a quick account, just you know, name and email type of thing. Um, but it's been fun. We've been trying to wrap up most of our programs with that. Um, we even started doing our 
staff meetings um, every now and then using it because I'm, I'm like, I talk to my manager directly once a week and a few other people, but you know, two weeks go by and I'm like, I haven't talked to my office manager really. Yeah. <laughs> so we're starting mm -hmm. to try to, you know, focus on more one-on-one -on -one conversations in the, on the team here. Nice. Yeah. Will there be other people, like, are there other professionals that will join for the networking piece or is it just the participants? Just the participants, though I will say, um, because even the other sessions we've offered, they're geared toward interns, you know, but it's mm -hmm. not exclusive, especially career readiness, how many people are back in the job market right now. So there are some people signed up that are not students, like, you know, they're definitely mid-level in their career okay, and cool. whether they're on the hunt or what. Um, so I, I'd assume those people, I'm sure, will will go to the network. Yeah, no, that makes sense. I was just getting more for context around, like, whether I should or shouldn't join this. But, right. Yeah, because I can't really offer anything, like, hard technically in the, mm -hmm. if you give them advice but right how was your birthday um it was great thank you for asking <laughs> <laughs> um we went paddle boarding my wife and i went paddle boarding with our puppy oh nice oh that's so fun mm -hmm. It was, oh no, Tuesday was, it was pretty nice and it like downpoured all of a sudden. Yeah, we got afternoon. like, we went out in the morning. So we actually like got the best part of the day, which was awesome. Yeah, well, that's good. When we were doing a prep call, we realized it was her birthday as well as my dad's. So that's why yeah. I <laughs> the weather, because my parents were trying a new restaurant that only had outdoor. My mom's like, I don't think we're going to make it. And then it ended up just stopping raining just in time for them to get there. Wow. And, so, nice. Yeah. <laughs> July always up in the air the storm yeah it's been really like unsettled lately the weather mm -hmm. Matt are you presenting or is it your um your team no well I had Jessica and um Michelle that were going to present uh my two of my team um however Jessica is not she she doesn't she gets anxious about she you know this team is actually still junior when they're you know in regards to presenting and the entire team does need some coaching around that so we're bringing in a we're actually going to bring in a coach but um she's taken herself off of that she'll be on this call but she will not cool. present uh i'll present in her place but michelle will still present with me she'll help me she's one of my recruiters uh, but jessica is not you know they just i they, they all get nervous and they all yeah mm -hmm. and so we're going to bring in a coach which i think is smart to help us yeah and we've been investigating which coach to bring in there's a couple coaches we've scoped out and, well yeah uh, he'll be on the call today i don't know if you've ever uh worked with them or heard of them but ethan becker of the speech improvement company yeah he does a really good workshop he led our team through one for presentation skills and then um even just like consistency with our, our brand and our message, but it was sure. because of how we worked ideally for him. It's like a three or four day, all day kind of workshop. Yeah. Yeah. The, the way our calendars worked, we did them every other Monday across two months or something. So I would imagine had we done it the right way, it would have been even more effective, but yeah, you know, if you want to connect with him after you'll see kind yeah. of his intro to it today, but um, he does a There's, really great job, him and his we, team. We found that there's so many out there mm -hmm. that um, we started looking into it. I mean, there's a lot of speech coaches and a lot of presenting and communication coaches, which um, which is good. We found a few, but it's just hard because we want to get it like ongoing and continuous. And we want to have private, you know, one-on-one -on -one sessions. So. I think it's just going to be, it's a skill. Like I told this team, I said, it's a skill yet you'll, you'll, you'll learn, you know, you'll, mm -hmm. you shouldn't feel bad about it. It's not a, something that everyone can do. You, you gain that confidence, you gain that ability eventually. Right. So take doing time. it online is like a whole nother thing too. If you're like, I know. I noticed even, even just knowing like, like where to look, I'm like, I usually have two screens. So I'll watch yeah. the recording and be like, I didn't look in my camera one time. So it's, it's <laughs> like, you're totally, yeah. you know, 
got to get used to everything. Especially again. if you're like, you're dealing with the PowerPoint, you're sharing a screen, you're presenting. It can, mm -hmm. I can definitely like, even just since moving online, like it's a different way I have to think about um, presenting when I'm doing it remotely like this. Yeah, exactly right. So. That's good though. I know a lot of um, like recruiting teams will do like open houses and do different types of recruiting events. So it'd be awesome to see Mimecast be able to do that. It'd be cool. Yeah, no, definitely. Hey, Michelle. Hi. Hi guys. Hello. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Matt, when we present, did you want me to share the presentation or did you want to share it on the screen? Um, yeah, do you wouldn't mind sharing it and then I can, yeah. Okay, cool. I, I get hung up on that Zoom, <laughs> yeah. the Zoom presenter mode and the, I've been so... <laughs> Mackenzie, what's going on with Tech Jam? Oh, makes me so <laughs> sad. Um, it was funny. My contact at Fenway pinged me last week. He's like, um, we've got our 2021 baseball schedule lined up. I'm like, how can you even say that with confidence? Uh, but <laughs> let me know if you want to pick your Tech Jam date. And I said, We're, we can't even think about that till really till there's a vaccine, till phase four. You know, it's, I know. it's a bummer, but someday it will happen. So sad. I know, I know. Well, I was really looking forward to Fenway this year. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was signed up. I know. <laughs> we'll get back there. As a, uh, you know, when we were in limbo with things, my contact over there invited me. They usually invite their season ticket holders to it, but it was a Zoom with a few of the players while they were like in their homes quarantining to get to know them. So that was kind of funny. <laughs> Right. talking about like yeah what they're doing and it's just so funny the difference between some of their home setups some are just like who was it um Ben attendee looked like he was in a college dorm compared to like <laughs> Martinez is in this like palace in Florida it was just really funny to, to see the different personalities coming through that's crazy um, yeah so yeah they're definitely trying to keep us engaged for when that can happen <laughs> Um, thank you to people that are joining so far. Um, we have a decent group signed up today, so we'll give it a few minutes before we kick things off, but we'll plan to get started shortly. Feel free to share your camera if you'd like to. We want this to be as engaging as possible, so um, definitely don't be shy.
Okay, in the interest of time, I'll get things kicked off here. Um, thanks to everyone for joining so far. I'm Mackenzie Labert with Mass TLC, uh, organizing the summer's intern programming. Today's our career readiness workshop. Um, so just to start off, we always like to thank Mass TLC's global sponsors. These organizations really um, help us with not only their treasure, but their time and thought leadership to uh, really be staples in the tech industry and community here in Massachusetts. So we're thankful for their support as well as uh, this program sponsor. So our underwriting sponsor, Akamai, uh, as well as our silver sponsor, Mimecast, who's here today to lead one of our sessions. So just a quick review of the agenda. Um, so we have Michelle and Matthew from Mimecast who are gonna walk through a resume review session. Um, definitely feel free to chat in your questions as they come through, but we'll get to them. If not, we'll catch up at the end with them. Um, followed by Brianne from Northeastern on LinkedIn best practices. So making your LinkedIn more than just your online version of a resume, but how to really use it as a proactive tool. After that, we have Dr. Ethan Becker of the Speech Improvement, who will walk us through key presentation skills and how that may look a little bit different in a virtual world for a bit. And then we'll wrap up with speed networking. So for anyone who was on our welcome session, we did this um, on a platform called Hopin. So we'll be leaving the Zoom and moving over to that platform. I'll walk through what that looks like um, when we get to that point in the schedule, but we'll leave that open till about five o'clock. And that's just a fun way to connect with your peers, um, you know, randomly matched up with each other for a brief video chat. You can talk about what you learned or questions you still might have, just get to know each other a bit. So at that point, I'm gonna hand it over to Matthew and Michelle from Mindcast to uh, start with the first part of today's workshop. Thanks for joining. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um... Uh, welcome everyone. Uh, glad to be here. We're glad to be a partner with um, Mass TLC and glad to sponsor the Battle of the Interns this summer. Um, myself and Michelle will be presenting today and um, you might hear the word, you know, I'm the director of talent acquisition. Um, you might hear talent acquisition is thrown around out there quite a bit. Um, and talent acquisition is a newer term for recruiters in um, the workplace today. Corporate recruiting uh, has come a long way and changed their tone and changed their name. And talent acquisition is, is one of the terms you'll hear quite a bit. So I just wanted to put that out there in case some of you are asking what talent acquisition is. That really simply is the today's corporate recruiter. It is the newer term that they use. So, so we'll, we'll kick this off. We're going to talk about how to build a resume today. Um, so first and foremost, we'll go through this slide and Michelle's gonna give me a hand here with this uh, presentation. Um, we're gonna talk about building your resume and especially early careers and new grads, building a resume. One of the most important things I like to see as a talent acquisition professional, a corporate recruiting professional, is to see a resume coming out of a new grad that special, is, is all condensed on one page. You're gonna want a one page resume. That's the most important piece to realize when you're putting your resume out there, condense it on one page, early career, new grads, one page resumes are the standard. Uh, I do see a lot of new grads coming through that have a bit longer resumes, two pages or one and a half pages. I would try to condense the resume down to a one page resume. That's a big deal today. Uh, I wouldn't make it any longer than that. So keep that in mind as you put together your resume. So one big caveat and piece to this is that you definitely want to lean on your career services department at the university uh, to help construct a resume. The career professionals in those uh, offices can help. Uh, you can lean on some of your advisors as well. They've got some experience with that. But putting together a resume, you're going to want to get some advice uh, on how to, to construct your resume from these career professionals in those offices. And th that's, a big, that's a big deal to do. You can ask mentors and pieces like, you know, things like that for, for advice. But I think that the career service department is, is definitely one to tap into. Um, one of the big things I like to see on a resume is a professional summary at the top of the resume. Uh, below your name, below your email address, below your address at the top, you're going to put some sort of professional summary that's going to really sum up the resume. Uh, for an early career, someone that's searching for a, a, a specific role, you, you may want an objective at the top. That objective is going to tell that reader what you're particularly looking for in a role. Might be something along the lines of your major or something that you concentrated on while you're in school uh, that you're looking for in the marketplace. So you want to have that out there 
uh, at the top of the resume. As you gain more experience, I usually change that professional summary to a summary of qualifications. It really sums it up in a more paragraph form, and it can really tell the reader what they're about to get into as they skim that resume. Now, one thing to keep in mind with talent acquisition professionals in these corporations that you're submitting the resume to, they're not spending a lot of time reading resumes nowadays because the volume of the resume is coming in. That's one thing to realize. So you want to get your point across very quickly. You're going to want to put it out there. What you're looking for, get the point across right up front. Uh, I like to have um, a list of, of skills uh, right at the top, some sort of bullet list of maybe some of your skills under that summary, uh, your education right at the top that, you know, completed degree and some of the things you did while you were in school at the top and under that education education with certifications, extracurricular activities, some of the clubs and organizations that you belong to while you were in school. Uh, those are big things to really boost up and, and make that education section a little bit more robust. Some people just put their simply their degree. They might put down uh, a, a fraternity or something they belong to, uh, maybe some sports or anything they played well in school. Uh, that's something you can also put down as well. Uh, but I like to make that education section, especially if you're just graduating, a very robust section and have some skills as well uh, underneath that professional summary at the top, whether, like we just talked about. Specific jobs that you're applying to, uh, you want to tailor that resume, give that resume a tone for the specific role that you're applying to. So you might be looking for a specific role, marketing, finance, uh, could be uh, engineering or IT, you want to give that resume a tone. And remember, you can have multiple versions of your resume. I've seen resumes, uh, uh, different versions of resumes that come in for certain roles. It could be a finance tailored resume, it could be a project management or project coordination type of resume. It could be a resume that is tailored to marketing. Whatever, whatever types of roles that you're concentrating on, you can switch up the theme of the resume, okay? On the next slide. Hi everyone, um, my name is Michelle Colina. I work on Matt Lipack's team, uh, team at Mimecast. I'm part of the talent acquisition team. Um, so I just wanted to quickly introduce myself. Matt and I are gonna, as he had mentioned, we would alternate through, the, through these slides and share some of our ideas with you. Um, so um, another piece to include on your resume um, is definitely your, co your contact information. There's so many resumes that I receive, you wouldn't believe that it, there isn't a phone number or an email address on it and don't know how to get in touch, in touch with them and their resume is great. So be sure to you know, include um, at least a phone number and um, an email address so that the recruiter can get in touch with you and, and set up that, that phone interview. Um, in terms of home address, it, you rarely see that on a resume May, especially for privacy reasons. So, but I think definitely the the email address and um, uh, your phone number for contact information is definitely key right at the top of the resume. Um, that's easy for a recruiter to find. Um, you also want to make sure that you're including an opening statement, a summary, an objective of the type of role that you're going for. So if you're just graduated from college or from a program and you're seeking a specific type of role, um, be sure to, you know, write a line that says um, seeking um, an entry level opportunity as a financial analyst um, in um, the insurance industry, if you know which industry you want to work in. So if you're writing a clear objective, what your goal is, what type of role you're trying to accomplish, you also want to put that at the top of your resume as well so that when a recruiter is reading from top to bottom, they can see the type of objective that, that you're seeking. Especially if you are a junior level um, candidate and you don't have many years of experience, um, but you've got a couple internships, maybe in a couple different fields, it's definitely important to put that objective right at the top of your resume so that the recruiter knows, um, you know, what type of opportunity that you're seeking. And then as you progress in your career and you get more um, experience under your belt, your resume will truly show that, um, you know, what specific area that you're focusing on, whether you have a career in HR or a career in finance, um, accounting, or as a teacher, and they'll see that progression um, throughout different organizations with the same type, within the same type of um, uh, department and same type of field. Um, work history is something that, you know, definitely you want to include um, in bullet points. Recruiters like to receive bullet points. Sometimes um, you'll see, I'll receive resumes of paragraphs, summaries of what they've done in each job. It's really easy for a recruiter to read 
uh, from top to bottom and read bullet points. They're looking for key words, um, you know, to, uh, to call out. Um, if, if a recruiter is um, responsible for filling a role at Mimecast, um, or anywhere for that, that, for that matter. Um, there definitely, there's specific skills that go with that role. So when a recruiter is skimming a resume under work history, they wanna see what you've accomplished. And bullet points is definitely the easiest and specific skill. Um, you wanna call out specific, um, specific skills. Um, and then you'd also wanna make sure that you include education. As Matt had mentioned, education is huge on a resume. Um, whether you include it on the top or the bottom, but you want to make sure what you've studied at school is on there, um, what you've graduated, where, you know, the school where, where you went to school, um, your year of graduation, um, what your degree was in. And if you are a recent college grad, I would, wanna, I would definitely recommend uh, make sure that you include some classes, some courses that you've taken. Um, you know, because if you have a degree in marketing, um, which is very broad, but maybe you started, you did data analytics, marketing analytics, you took classes around that though, and you're going for a um, marketing analytics opportunity. It's great for a recruiter to see that you've taken those types of analytical classes within marketing. Um, it really, it really helps and ha helps you stand out as well. Soft skills and technical skills. Um, so you want to, as I mentioned before, skills are huge. Creating an own, your own section in your resume um, of skills, a separate section. Um, of technical skills. Um, if you've got, you know, experience with any um, IT, IT skills, um, PowerPoint, um, Microsoft Word, very simple, doesn't have to be complicated if you don't have more, um, you know, detailed IT, IT technical skills, but PowerPoint, Word, um, Excel, um, Microsoft Outlook, um, Google, um, you know, so that, so that is definitely, um, it's easy to, um, uh, just create a section for you know, soft skills and technical skills, communication skills, um, detail oriented. So it's important for a recruiter to know, you know, kind of get to know you, um, what in addition to your work history, what additional skills you have. Um, certifications and professional memberships. Those are great to include um, along with your education, any um, uh, certifications that you've received, um, professional memberships. Um, for example, um, in human resources, um, we, we sometimes see HR professionals who are members of NERA, North America Human Re North Northeast Human Resources Association, or SHRM, Society of Human Resources Professionals. Um, if there's a, a, coming right out of college, if you're somebody who was a member of maybe American Marketing Association at your local school, um, it's great to include any any organizations that you uh, professional professional memberships that. Um, that you were a part of while in college, um, and and as well as um, any certifications, um, achievements and awards. As a recent college grad, you know if you've received any awards, if you were on the dean's list all four years, or two out of the four years, or um, you received any awards for um, outstanding leadership at, at at your school, or if you were president of an organization, it's always great to make sure you know include that because that shows leadership. Um, and then additional sections, community involvement, volunteering. This is more of a filler. Um, and it's, it's always nice to see sometimes as, um, as a recruiter, when we're reviewing resumes and we're looking at entry level resumes, what else is this person involved in? Are they well-rounded? Um, it may not have anything to do with the day-to-day -day of the role, but it's sometimes nice to see, um, and even well, people who are very mature in their profession and have many years of work experience still like to include community involvement um, volunteering that they participate outside of work. Um, I think it shows a lot about, tells, tells the recruiter a lot about the type of person they are and that they're also programmed. One of the biggest questions that I get about a like, new grad's resume or an entry level or you know, uh, early career resume um, is should I put work history on the resume that's not my internship? Should I put the work history that Maybe it was a part-time job while I was in school. I always say, by all means, put that on there because it does show that you were working while you were in school. It shows uh, teamwork that might have been uh, happening at, at the, the particular positions you've held. Uh, it could show, um, you know, just how you balance different things uh, throughout. You know, like I said, but working a, a part-time role. Uh, or, part, or almost a full-time role while you're balancing a 
a class load, uh, multitasking, those sorts of things. So I definitely would encourage to add uh, part-time work or uh, you know 30 hour a week work or whatever it might be uh, while you're in school. Put that on there as well. Could be anything that we're doing. Does not have to just be internships as your work history. Um, and it's not just fillers either uh, for those types of roles. You know, you want to have some sort of content with those. You could have been maintaining that job through the entire four years of college. So I would add that. Uh, just as Michelle, like Michelle was mentioning, bullet points are the biggest piece that I think uh, a lot of uh, uh, career professionals are missing out on nowadays when they submit a resume. Uh, bullet points for the the job history, uh, putting things in a bullet format is going to be just a quicker and easier way for the recruiters to really skim that resume, to get to the point quickly. Have a bullet point there, put it in bullet format. It's gonna be short and sweet. Uh, make sure that bullet is to the point. It has all the content you're looking for in that particular area. And you have to you know, make sure you put, depending on the length of that role, I'd like to see for longer duration roles, I'd like to see a lot more bullet points in there. For a shorter duration role, I'd like to see a lesser bullet points in there. I mean, I don't like to see 10 bullet points if, it, if the role is only two months long. You know, so just try to balance the bullet points out with the length of the role. I always encourage the, uh, the resume writer to do that, to the first writing that resume. Pick a format, just as it says, pick a format that's easy to read, uh, a font that's a very classic font, some font that's very easy to read. I wouldn't put, you know, make that resume too hard or difficult to read. Pick a font that, you know, Times New Roman or one of those types of fonts, a career type font, that's an easy font to read. You don't want to make that resume a crazy font or anything like that, unless you're a very creative type. I see creative resumes that do that with their fonts. Keep the font in a general font. So the reader is uh, not, you know, uh, trying too hard to read it. And make sure the font is in a uh, font size that is, uh, uh, you know, not too small for that reader. Uh, the one page, like I mentioned early on, the one page is, is a given. Uh, early career and new grads, one page is, is what the standard format would be. I would not make it more than that. Even if you feel like you have a lot more to say, just keep it general, keep it on that one page. Action verbs, um, maintain, responsible for, manage, past tense about a job you previously have. This is one of the biggest mistakes I see in resumes today. The past tense is not used on previous roles. It does look a little odd when we're reading these resumes not to see a past tense on a job you held two years ago, past tense on a class you took two years ago, past tense on a club that you were in. You know, you want to make sure that you maintain that throughout. Data and numbers to show the volume, your, uh, your manager quotas you hit. You know, you want to put statistics on the resume as much as possible. If you're a salesperson, if you're selling in some sort of role like that, show those numbers, show the statistics of that role. You want to make sure those, are, those catch the attention of the reader. Um, important achievements, consider, you know, separate skills section, specifically highlighting relevant accomplishments, and education, and other work experiences, you want to make sure that you have that separate skills section to call out those skills and making sure that they're, they're catching the attention of the reader. And then a location of your current and former employers. It's another big problem I see nowadays of resumes. A lot of, of the, uh, the career professionals are not including uh, the locations of those uh, current and former employers. You know, they want to make sure that we're putting the you know, what city and state that that uh, employer was in. You know, maybe we want to look up where that company was located as the recruiter to see where, you know, where the particular company was. Um, an objective or purpose on the resume, again, you know, we, we go back to this and we're repeating this because we feel like this is, this is an important piece. You know, you want to put something at the top of that resume that calls out what you're looking for, what the theme of that resume is going to be, something that you know you're targeting in your job search that's going to be a big deal that's big and then again you know moving showing how you progressed in your career 
uh, in past companies, how your career's progressed, showing a career trajectory in the company, you know, as far as promotions and how you moved up in that organization, uh, that's going to be a big piece as well. I mean, as the reader, as recruiters, we like to see that the person was promoted and has progressed through their career. So that's a big deal. I think showing that and showing that career trajectory with dates and how long you were in those roles and then you, how you moved up in that organization is big. And you could call that out. And again, you know, Michelle mentioned it, phone numbers, email addresses. I like to tell uh, career professionals getting out in the workforce, make sure you have a very generic or so email address. You know, anything that's kind of crazy or fun, you thought it was really, you know, a joke or anything like that while you were in school as an email address, make sure you just get a Gmail address, first initial, last name. That's just a, a good way to do it. You'd be surprised hiring managers pay attention to small details on resumes. Mm -hmm. They do. And, and crazy emails and things like that are going to catch their attention. So just make sure that you keep it as professional as possible. Remember, this is a professional document. You do not want to have anything crazy like that. So, and I think another important point to add to going back to education, what I, what I never like to see on a resume, do not add your high school education on a resume. A resume is going to be, a, you know, your college education on up. High school is never added to a resume. I've never, uh, I never like to see that on a resume. I have seen individuals that add maybe a private school or a very exclusive private school that they attended on a resume. I still like to keep to, you know, the, the, uh, the rule of thumb that college education on career wise is what you add to a resume. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks, Matt. Um, resume do not. <laughs> so um, do not use graphics. The simpler the better. So it's important to keep your resume as simple and straightforward. Um, you know, I know sometimes we'll receive resumes um, in marketing if somebody works in graphic design or creative. They like to get very creative with those types of resumes. So if you're applying for a creative role, um, that's completely acceptable. Um, but I think if you're applying for um, let's say accounting or financial analyst or human resources or technical support um, or, net, or an engineering role, um, it's, it's best to, to take the, the graphics out of it. Um, just keep it very simple. Um, sometimes people like to, they'll think, you know, if I, if I make my resume look pretty and add borders and colors, um, it'll, it'll stand out more to, with a recruiter. But like I said, we just like to see, recruiters like to see very simple, straightforward resumes that get, get to the point and really show who you are and, and what, what you've done, your, what, your, what your work history has been and, and what schooling you've had. So um, do not stress if you don't have any relevant experience, whether you're fresh out of college or switching to a brand new industry, you can help bolster your lack of rel relevant work experience by listing your transferable skills, related side projects, um, and, and relevant coursework. So, um, you know, entry level candidates, you re you, you're trying to land that first job. You're fresh out of school. Um, you maybe held um, a part-time job while going to school and had some, you know, maybe you, 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 you held a job on campus or off campus, or um, you had a few internships and you were able to get some real world um, experience. It's great to include those, um, but don't stress that. I mean, you know, and when we are look, when we are screening resumes for entry level um, roles that we're trying to fill, um, we, we go into that knowing that, you know, we're not expecting a candidate to have, um, you know, multiple years of work history, because you're trying to get that you're trying to get that, that, that land, that first opportunity. So um, do not use job descriptions. Do not use a, a job descriptions, exact wording. So um, if you are, um, you know, you, you're on Indeed and you find you're on Indeed or Monster or LinkedIn and you find an opportunity that you really like, um, it's good to tailor your resume to that type of role, but try not to use the exact wording. You want this to be yourself. You know, you know, you want to be true to yourself when you're putting when you're putting together your resume. Because if you do get called for that phone interview, um, or or the face to face or the 
the face-to-face -face interview, um, the interviewer is going to have, you know, you're, you're going to ask you questions and you're going to get stumped. Um, you want to make sure that you're comfortable with explaining your resume and walking a, a candidate, walking a, a recruiter through um, your work history and what you've done while you're in school. So um, it's, you know, you can certainly tailor your resume to that job that you see, but make sure just be mindful that um, you want to um, be, tr be true to yourself and be honest with, with with the work that you've done. So uh, don't be dishonest about your skills or work experience, as I just mentioned. Um, and then do not include random, unrelated, or off-putting hobbies on your resume. Um, you know, some people will say that they like to watch movies um, in their spare time, um, go for walks, they're into running. I, I don't think that that's really relevant on a resume. Um, I remember when I first graduated from college, I was trying to find, you know, trying to, I had a, a couple internships on there. I put where I went to school and some coursework that I did. But as a filler, I think I, I remember putting my hobbies and interests on there as well. Um, and at the time, I thought that that was great. And um, but I think definitely just keep it keep it specific to what you've been involved in at school. Um, I think if you were an athlete, for example, if you were four year varsity on the basketball team or you played lacrosse in college, it's good to put that on there as well um, because I think some some uh, uh, for specific positions um, for maybe some entry-level sales roles. We like to see that, um, you know, our can the candidate has maybe participated in um, a team, team-oriented um, group or played sports um, in, in college because um, it means they're, they're team, team oriented, they're competitive, um, they have those, those um, they, they come in, they, they work hard, they like to win. Those are, those are skills that we, we like to see that, that, that translate into um, our sales organization, that those types of mentality. So, um, you know, so I think if you played sports, I think it's great to show that you were, that you, that you did that. So it's okay to include that. But if you're, you know, like to watch movies, um, you know, like to, like to play video video games that you can definitely leave off of your resume. Um, tonight, uh, do not try to hide any gaps. Do not, don't use pronouns um, and don't, don't include references. So um, try not to hide any gaps in your resume. And I think this kind of goes more as you, as you move forward um, in your career and you get more work history under your belt. Um, you want to make sure that you're showcasing each position, um, every, every company that you've worked at. And um, sometimes, you know, if somebody uh, maybe leaves their job early or um, for example, down the road, if, uh, you know, a company has a layoff and there's a, a, a gap in your resume by a few months, um, you know, I think it's okay as long as you have um, an explanation as to why you had that gap. Oh, I was taking some time off to care for a family member or um, I took some time off in between opportunities. So I think there, employers are sometimes looking for an explanation as to why um, you had a gap in your resume. And also keep in mind, um, you know, if you're searching for a new job in between roles um, to stay busy and a recruiter's definitely going to ask you what you've done during that gap. Did you take classes? Did you, you know, make sure you continue to sharpen your skills. Um, and then don't include references. I think at the, at the, um, uh, you, a recruiter will, um, uh, will, will ask you um, for references if they move to the offer stage and they decide to, to you know, to move forward with you as a candidate. Um, so they'll definitely follow up with you when the time is right, um, but definitely don't need references right off the bat um, before you have a phone interview or have even, or before you've gotten to an interview stage. So, you know, running through these really, you know, quickly and, uh, you know, making sure we're keeping on time here. Um, you know, I think it, it's the professional standards of avoiding pronouns or referring to yourself in a third person, you know, when listing your duties, I designed a web page or Sam designed a web page, you know, designed a web page. You want to stick to making it simplified. Interest, of course. Is it okay to include love of hiking or travel? You know, Michelle just mentioned, you know, outside interests can provide hiring managers with more personal views of candidates, potential cultural fit, but make sure the interests are aligned with the company. Uh, I wouldn't hesitate to include some of the interests, but you want to make sure that you're not just going into too much detail with those hobbies and some of those pieces. You may want to leave some of those things out, but, you know, think about including some interests that you had in school had with a particular area of a club or an organization. Um, but any 
uh, the last point here, um, middle school and email addresses, we, I touched on this already, make sure that your email address is a professional email address, social media as well. You want to make sure your social media, um, you know, employers sometimes do a search um, and they can go out on Google and they can pull anyone up nowadays. So make sure that you do a quick sweep of the social media channels, make sure that your email address is professional and make sure everything is clean and professional. Okay, um, so I'll go through these quickly because I know that we're, we've got to move on to the next uh, speaker. So um, this is your time to shine. Make sure you tell a story, what sets you apart from other candidates. Recruiters like to see what sets you apart because it's a very competitive market um, at all times, even entry level. Um, providing concrete evidence of your skills and other sections of your resume is a way to make yourself stand out. Um, getting views, um, get many views on your resume, share your resume with those in career services, talent acquisition and HR. Um, so make sure you're, you're sharing your resume and getting feedback feedback before you have a final document to mail out. Um, always be honest, everything on your resume is fair game. So uh, make sure that you can talk to every bit bullet point, you can back up the work that, you're, that, that you've done and you can, you can really tell a great story about yourself. Um, make sure you proofread and edit um, as a, you know, um, definitely share your, if, if um, you know, proofreading and spelling isn't, you know, uh, your strong suit, you definitely want to have somebody else um, be a second set of eyes look at it. Design for skimmability. Like I mentioned before, um, hiring managers and recruiters just like look up, look for keywords when they're, when they're skimming resumes. Um, so definitely make sure that it's, your, your resume is easy to read, mix up your words. If every bullet on your resume starts with responsible for, readers will get bored. So you want to mix up um, what, you know, um, um, mix up the words on your resume, listing relevant skills. As an entry level applicant, you may not have much ap ap applicable experience yet, um, but make sure that you know you're you're also you know you're including. Um, you know, the relevant skills, but also um, soft skills, communication, teamwork, um, detail oriented, um, that, that also tells um, a recruiter a lot about you and the type of worker you are. Um, and then when you list your responsibilities, make sure to incorporate strong action verbs. Don't say responsible for uh, creative, managed, improved. And that is our presentation. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you, guys. Thank, Thank you, guys. You, everyone. Thanks so much. Does anyone have any questions specific to the resume part of the workshop? You could either just say them out loud or throw them in the chat. Um, okay, great. So we can move on um, to Brianne for the LinkedIn part. And if you think of questions as we go, feel free to put them in the chat and we can always circle back. Awesome. Thank you, Mackenzie. Um, I'm just going to queue up my screen. Um, all right. So can everyone see this? Okay, um, so I'm Brianne McDonough. I'm a co-op coordinator, co-op faculty at Northeastern University um, in the College of Computer Sciences. And in addition to working directly with students, I also work with a number of our companies um, that host students for their co-op. Um, so I'm going to be talking about LinkedIn today and really with my goal of this workshop is to have it be um, pretty in tune with what you all need. So as I'm going through the presentation, if you have certain things that you want to focus more on, please raise your hand and ask for that. I'm happy to jump onto LinkedIn and kind of show you how to navigate some of these different steps, um, but I'll jump it off with the presentation and then we can go from there. Um, so getting started with LinkedIn. Um, and Really, as I'm going through this first part, I just want you thinking a little bit about what brought you here today for the LinkedIn part of this session. Um, so whether it was just kind of the simple, I need to set up my profile, I need to set up my LinkedIn, I don't have one yet, or I have one, but I haven't logged into it in two years, and it's pretty outdated. Um, are you looking for that, or are you looking for something a little bit more hands-on? Are you looking to see how you can connect with people? Um, how do you find alumni? How do you follow companies and groups? Um, and how do you find professionals? So just think about that and please just type that in the chat if there are certain areas that you want to focus on. Um, so setting up your profile, um, this is the most important part of LinkedIn. Your profile is going to um, be your landing page that people go onto when they click on your name. Um, so a lot of your profile is gonna come directly from the resume and we've had a great 
um, session just now on what are the key pieces of your resume, um, I would say that the majority of what was already discussed carries into setting up your profile for LinkedIn. You want it to be clean, you want it to be neat, you want it to be professional. Where LinkedIn is different is you're not limited to that one page, flat page. Um, LinkedIn can be a lot more dynamic. You're adding experiences, you're connecting your experience to that particular organization. So it's a lot more dynamic and there's a lot more that you can do with LinkedIn other than just having it be a page to host your experience. Um, I'm going to use um, these two profiles, Jonathan and Celine, who are both students that I worked with at Northeastern to kind of show you some examples. So um, Jonathan is a recent graduate who is now a data engineer at this company, Recorded Future. And Celine is a currently in her third co-op as a product designer intern at Facebook. Um, so like I was saying, or I started to say, your profile is your brand. Um, so you really want it to look nice and neat and tidy, just as the same way that you want the resume. Um, you want to have a professional photo that has good lighting. Um, don't use a selfie. Um, that doesn't come off as professional. You really just want to have a nice, neat photo of you with you being the only one in the photo so that the person looking at it doesn't have to figure out which one of these people is the profile that I'm looking at. Um, so if you don't have a good picture that's not a selfie, just ask the friend to take you one, it, take one of you. It doesn't have to be professionally done. Um, just something where you look nice, and neat, put together. Um, you don't have to have a suit on. Just be yourself in the, in the picture. Um, you want to have that three to five sentence summary to introduce yourself, your goals, and your interests. Um, you want to build out your education and any part-time or volunteer opportunities you've held. Um, like Matt was saying a little bit about this, on the LinkedIn page, you can be a lot more, you can go into a lot more detail. Um, so even if you did a three month internship, you can go in and add a little bit more bullets. You're not limited to that one page. Um, so where you might feel that the resume is kind of restricting you in terms of length and content, the LinkedIn is pretty much um, not going to limit you in any way. You can have as much information there as you would like. Um, Include club involvement, service work, projects, and extracurriculars. I'm going to go through some of these examples when I jump to these pages. Um, but this is there's no bounds to what you can do here. So if you were on a hackathon and you worked with three other people to build or a con you built a concept or you built some code to as part of the hackathon, add that as an experience, add that as a project. Um, it's great for a potential recruiter to be able to see, oh, they actually participated in this hackathon and this was their concept. And um, much like an athletic experience can demonstrate teamwork, some of these other project experiences can as well, especially in like the competition environment. Um, as usual, proper grammar spelling is also very important. So having a friend double check your work um, is definitely recommended. I also say that sometimes for me, writing these things up in a Word document where I'm going to have the spell check or I'm going to have Grammarly enabled, that's really going to help me make sure that I have good tone and good grammar and punctuation throughout, and then copying it into LinkedIn. That's another trick to use if that's a challenge for you. Um, so let me jump a little bit. Actually, let me check the chat. And I can see there's, there's chat happening. And I see the chat. It was on um, a resume question from before. So oh, OK, you know. good. So mm -hmm. I will jump back. Um, so I'm going to just jump over to Celine's profile real quick. And I want to show you just she has done a couple co-ops now as she's a Northeastern student. So she's had a couple internships. Um, she has a great summary that's pretty straightforward, just a couple of sentences. Um, she's a third year undergraduate with a combined major in computer science and design. Um, she's interested in entrepreneurship and she chose that as a major. She's doing design and tech. Her most recent career interests are um, with product design and designing for social good. And she um, looks forward to taking empowering courses during her career while leveraging internship and leadership opportunities. 
she shares a little bit about what she's been doing outside of her traditional internship experience. Um, and then these are her internship experiences, which she's listed. Um, she doesn't have a ton of detail here, but some of these are pretty straightforward in terms of um, what she would be doing in the role. Um, what I really like about what Celine's done, she's made sure that it's linked, you know, this is linked to Facebook. So you're getting the Facebook logo in there. Um, she has these different experiences. Um, this Scout Studio project, I happen to know that this is a um, this is a club at Northeastern. So she was designed, she was involved on a on a pretty deep level on a project for four months. So she chose to put this in as an experience, um, which I think was the right call for her. And you can read a little bit about it. She was a TA for us in the co-op class, so she has her TA role here. Um, and these are going to be demonstrating things like. If you're, an, if you're a TA for an academic class, you are coming with um, a variety of skills and expertise, facilitating, training, teaching, but also you're coming with some content knowledge. Um, in, in this particular case, she was a TA for a co-op class. So she got to learn about different companies, employers, industry. Um, but if she was TAing for um, maybe uh, object-oriented design, then I would encourage her to list what were the concepts that you covered um, as a TA, what did you help teach. Um, so these can be very, very relevant experiences. I'm kind of going down a little bit. Um, you can see the education section built out here. She has chosen to put her high school, um, but like Matt has said, she's de she's gone into detail about some of the activities that she was involved with in these experiences. So it's not just, oh, I went to this high school, but it's I went to this high school and I was involved in these different um, clubs and organizations. Um, she has a life or um, a CPR certificate. So that's an interest of hers. Um, other volunteer experiences, um, skills and endorsements. This is, a, this is an important piece, I think, um, just really kind of defining, oh, I, I know HTML, I'm going to add that as a skill in my profile, or I know Python, so I'm going to make sure that that's listed here. Um, and these things are going to come into play if you're using the job search feature. Um, the more that you build out your profile, the better the AI is that's going to help recommend jobs for you. Um, so spending a little bit of time in your own LinkedIn profile and building out these different sections is going to help you as you continue on the job search. Um, listing some accomplishments, I always recommend interests. She's following some different companies um, that she might be interested in, um, maybe just maybe they're thought leaders like a Google and she wants to know, oh, what is Google recent news? So she's gonna follow Google as a company and make sure that any updates Google puts out there on LinkedIn are coming to her newsfeed. Um, so let me jump back to my presentation. So I talked a little bit about um, Celine's summary. I think it's very well written, um, pretty short and to the point. I don't have to read three paragraphs worth to really understand what she's doing. And that skill section is also very clear and concise. Um, if you're wondering what these little like 12 next to Excel and 10 next to Windows, these are endorsements. So on your profile, I can go in and I could endorse, say for example, Matt, um, I could go to his page and I can endorse that, yes, he's skilled at recruiting. He knows HR talent management. And I can give him a plus one for those different skills. Um, and, and that's just a nice thing to do for others, but it also helps you in your profile and, and show that, yes, not only do I think I'm skilled in that, but other people that are in my field also recognize the skills that I have in that area. Um, so building your network, um, once you have that profile built and you, you feel, you know, you might not have every section completely built out and that's okay, but you do want to start thinking about how do I now build my network? I have a profile, I have a picture, I'm fairly comfortable, you know, I have my education section, I have some of my volunteer experiences, maybe an internship, part-time job, um, anything and everything is fair game to add to your LinkedIn. Um, so what's next? How do you go actually and build your network? You're, you have a profile, but maybe you're only connected to one other person. So I recommend that you 
connect with your friends, your family, your classmates, um, people that you're in your classes in now, but maybe also folks that you look up to in the next, um, as the next year above you. Maybe they were a TA in your class and you know that they've done an internship. So connecting with your classmates, connecting with your peer group is very important. Um, instructors and faculty, if you're, if there's particular classes that you're really engaged with, you're really interested in the work that um, faculty are doing, connecting with them on LinkedIn, adding them to your network, um, you never know who they're connected with. So this is an important piece. Mentors and TAs. I mentioned TAs. I think mentors just as well. Um, I encourage my students con to connect with me as a co-op advisor. So connecting with an administrator or an advisor that you work with, um, these are all great ideas. Don't underestimate the need to or the 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 good in connecting also with like friends and family. I think oftentimes we don't necessarily think, oh, I'm going to connect with my cousin. I'm going to connect with my dad. I'm going to make sure I'm connected with my brothers. Um, but this is an important piece. You never know who they're connected with, or you might not think of their company necessarily as one that you might work at someday. But if you were to apply, having that on LinkedIn kind of makes those connections visible where they might not have been visible before. Um, and then alumni from your school. So, you know, you might find it helpful to connect with a couple of alumni, say that maybe you're interested in Mimecast as a company, and I, I'm interested in Mimecast. So I'm going to see, oh, are there any alumni from my school that are currently working at Mimecast that I might be able to reach out to and ask? Um, maybe I'm not asking for a job, but I'm going to ask, oh, what is it like to work at Mimecast? What is it like to be a software engineer there? Um, what do you recommend if I wanted to try to get a job there? Um, informational interviewing um, is really important for you to get to know your field and your industry as you're entering the job market. And LinkedIn can be a great way to find people to connect with for that reason. Um, I always recommend sending a note if you're just connecting with an acquaintance or someone you haven't actually met in person or if it's been a long time since you've met them. Um, follow companies. So I try to follow every single company that I work with um, at Northeastern for co-op. It's super helpful to see every, all of their updates, what they're working on, what their next big project is coming right into my news feed, um, similar to any other social media platform. Um, and it's just a way for me to get more exposed to careers. What's the lingo? What are people talking about? What's important? What's the next big thing for this company? Maybe it's a company that you interview with in a, in a week or so. And for you to be able to say, oh, I saw that Mimecast recently did this. That sounds like an awesome new product or way to go getting new customers. To be able to say that and bring that into an interview and have that knowledge is really important. Um, so following also industry thought leaders. So if you're a huge fan of um, Jeff Bezos and what Amazon is doing, you might choose to follow him, his company, his organization, um, if there's content that that individual is putting out there. And professional organizations. So um, for those of you that are in the technical industry, Michelle talked a little bit about this with marketing and marketing organizations, but professional organizations exist for every single field. Um, so connecting with making sure that if you're a technical professional, you're following the um, Association for Computing Machinery, you're following the regulant, relevant organizations, um, and you're in those groups that are going to be discussing um, relevant roles and new jobs that might be getting posted. Um, in joining groups, so for example, Mass TLC, they have a group. Um, it's filled with industry professionals. I think Matt and I are in it, and I'm sure Mackenzie's in it. Um, so putting yourself into those spaces, those virtual spaces where other professionals are, that can be really helpful as well. So that's kind of what I would recommend as the next step for how do you build your network. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, how to take this to the next level. So for searching for opportunities, for example, if you're looking for an internship or a job, um, the LinkedIn jobs feature is really great. 
Um, you can set up job alerts. So I could search, for example, for a software engineering job in the United States. And I could turn on this little job alert feature so that every day I'm getting an alert. Oh, these new jobs came up for software engineering intern. Um, you can see how I've done this in this screenshot here. And then there's a little um, toggle button where it says job alert on or off. Um, if you turn that on, you would be getting that digest on a daily or weekly basis, um, letting you know what new jobs get it, were getting posted. I recommend using this and saving jobs that you are interested in, even if you're not going to apply to them, because the AI functionality on LinkedIn is going to learn which jobs you're saving and recommend new jobs to you based on what you're interacting with and what types of industries and jobs you're um, leaning towards. Um, you can also specify your geographic area and job types through this um, and save jobs to come back to or apply directly. Um, sometimes it will let you apply right through here with um, using your LinkedIn profile. Other times it's going to bring you to, for example, PayPal's um, career site that you would apply on their site through. Um, so the next thing is searching for alumni or connections. So say that I did apply. Um, maybe I did a job search and I recently applied to a job at Chewy. Well, now I want to see or I want to figure out, do I even know anyone at Chewy? Maybe I have some connection already. Um, so you can actually use, or maybe you're not connected, but maybe there are a second connection. So maybe you could get an introduction. Um, so you want to use, you can, there's a couple ways you can do this. You can go into the search bar and you can, um, you can define using the filtering criteria. You know, I want to find people at Chewy specifically. Um, or you can go to right, or you can go right to Chewy's page and then navigate to all their employees. So let me show you how I would do this. Um, so I would go to Chewy. Um, they're a company that I already follow. Um, I have a connection here who is another recruiter at the organization. Um, but if I wanted to dive in deeper, I could go to see all these employees on LinkedIn. Um, and it's going to give me just a list of everyone who publicly states that they are working at LinkedIn. And then if I go into all filters, I can actually narrow this down much further to um, people that went to Northeastern. Um, so for example, yeah. So now I have people that work at Chewy that graduated from Northeastern. Um, and this could be really beneficial to you um, if, you're, if you recently applied or if you were just getting to see if you could make more connections with alumni in the field that were doing similar work that you were interested in. Um, so with my results, I was able to find 62, um, looks like current employees who graduated from Northeastern and that are currently employed at Chewy. Um, so if I applied to a physician, I could reach out to one of those people. Maybe I found that I actually had my own connection, um, that I knew someone personally. You could further define that if you wanted to see, oh, who are my first connections at Chewy? I actually don't have any. That went to Northeastern. But maybe if I took that off, I would find some. So there's Erin again. She's a, another campus recruiter. So can you see how you can use this to really go to the next level? It's not just about having your profile up there, um, but really unlocking the power of that. And I, you know, clicking on Erin, if I didn't know her and she was a connection of mine, it's possible that I could get an introduction to Erin um, or that I could ask another one of my connections to, I think right in here, you can go to get um, get an introduction. So it's not here because I I already know her, but there is a way to use these features. Um, this is also how you could request a recommendation. So if I had a, a classmate or somebody that I worked with for an internship and I wanted to 
ask them to rec recommend me and write me a recommendation that I would then put on my profile, this is the way that you would go about doing that. Um, so let me jump back to the presentation because I know we're coming up on time. Um, yeah, so identify individuals at specific organizations using all filters, search for um, search by school or college to find alumni from your institution, um, and then activities and posts. So a lot of times, I think people overlook the value of engaging on LinkedIn. So it's not just about, you know, putting yourself out there, but it's also like, what are you doing in the system? So here you can see my activity. I shared that I was presenting at today's workshop. Um, I commented on somebody's new job. Very happy for you. Congratulations. Um, here's another person's activity, but activity does show that you're engaged. It shows your activity. Maybe you had a recent um, project that you worked on, a hackathon that you participated, you posted about it. And this can just be another way to showcase and demonstrate your interests and your areas of expertise. Um, and then just I wanted to wrap up by giving some tips for getting started. So start small, um, build out your profile and connect with some friends, some colleagues. Um, I think it's the best place to start. Um, don't forget about learning through this process as well as you're connecting with others. Um, don't just connect and leave it be. Connect, look at their profile. What was their career journey? How did they get from point A to point B or C? They might be a CEO of a company. I'm sure they had a long journey before they became a CEO. Um, so getting getting there and getting a chance to look at, oh, what was what did they have before that? What was their job before that? If I want to be CEO today someday, um, that would be really helpful to know. Um, get ideas around what to include on your own profile from looking at other people. Um, there is also the ability to add attachments. You can link your GitHub. You could link a professional portfolio if you were a design major, for example. So there is a lot of functionality there and it is pretty intuitive. So I just recommend spending some time in the system. Um, when you're first getting started, I recommend swapping out one to two hours of your weekly social media time, whether that's on Snapchat or Instagram or Facebook, and put using that some of that time to spend on LinkedIn. Um, it can be fun. It starts getting fun once you have um, connections and you have things to look at. Um, there is a way to add a pronunciation to your profile through the mobile app. So um, this can be really helpful, especially for international students. Um, so I do recommend that adding, if that's helpful to you, to add that through the mobile app. Uh, and then definitely adding projects, links, any research that you've done, anything relevant. If you think it supports your career goals and your interests, I would say add it. Um, and that's the end of my presentation. So I'm happy to take um, any questions or tips from folks. Great, thank you so much. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, what do you think, Rand, uh, when people say, hey, is LinkedIn just a regular social media? Can I treat it as social media, like an Instagram or a Facebook? Do you, what do you, what do you, what's your perspective on that? So I definitely think that you need to think about who your audience is. I know that some people use LinkedIn, for example, if you're a recruiter, you're probably using LinkedIn as part of your job. You're going to be posting things about your company, about your organization. Um, for me, my audience tends to be professional. I want it to be a professional venue for me. Um, so I try to also keep my posts professional. And um, But I do think, you know, in some ways, this is an opportunity for you to show who you are. And if who you are comes, is, is, is easy to showcase on LinkedIn, for example, like I'm not afraid to join groups like Out in Tech um, that are LGBTQ identified groups, but that might not be everyone's choice. They might not want to belong to those organizations for fear that they might be discriminated against. So. I think really thinking about like, what are you personally comfortable with? 
and what are you comfortable with a recruiter or a possible employer seeing. Um, there is definitely a time and a place for posts that may be a little bit more politically charged or um, are somewhat controversial in nature, but you know you have to you have to find some balance in that because there is a lot of um, it's not necessarily black and white. Um, there's a lot of gray area in that as well. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay, great. I think we can move on to our final presenter. Um, we have Dr. Ethan Becker of the Speech Improvement Company. So I will let uh, Ethan start. Thanks, guys. All right. Can you hear and see me okay? Yes. All right. All right. And uh, are we, do I have access to share my screen or not so much? You should be able to. It looks like Brianne just okay. stopped her screen share. Yeah. Let's see if it lets you. Great. Excellent. And where are we timing wise? Um, I know we're a bit behind what we had planned. What, where, how much time? We plan to wrap give? the content um, at 430. That's about 25 minutes. But we're, we're running a few minutes behind that. I had you starting at four. So we're just about five minutes behind. Okay. Sounds good. Well, the, the, in that case, uh, there's probably uh, one major thing I'll talk about. Uh, first of all, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, if you hadn't, didn't have a chance to look at uh, who I am or, or our company, uh, the Speech Improvement Company. Uh, we're based out of Framingham, and we do speech coaching and training all over the world. We are the oldest speech coaching and training firm in the United States. So we've been around for a long time, since 1964. There's about 20 of us. We've got coaches on four continents. Uh, most of us are here in Massachusetts. That's where we're based. That's where we, we live. That's where the company started. And as speech coaches, we, well, for the most part, we help people to talk. And that's what we do for a living. Uh, everything from how to become comfortable around this whole business of talking to uh, being good at it, whatever that it happens to be. So in some cases, that might be standing up, giving a formal presentation, could be a job interview, could be uh, giving feedback to somebody, could be doing the interview, right? Anything related to talking. That's what myself and my colleagues uh, specialize in. It's what we've studied. Uh, we've all gone to school. We've studied at the graduate level or beyond. So I have two doctorates, an MBA, an undergrad, all related to speech communication and business. So, and I'm sharing this with you because I want you to feel very comfortable asking me anything at all related to the topic of communication, whether it's what I'm going to formally teach you in the, in the brief time we have together, or maybe something else that's on your mind. Uh, we've probably studied it and uh, have done a lot of coaching and training people on how to develop the skill around it. So that's who I am. Uh, our website is speechimprovement.com, if you wanna check that out. And you can follow me on LinkedIn. Here, I was thinking about what to cover today. Uh, you know, we go to a lot of different areas and I was thinking about interns and what, what's gonna be, what's gonna help an intern get to that next level. And we put down presentation skills as the topic. And I like that actually, it's a good topic because a lot of managers and executives, there's probably an expectation that you don't know how to present. So there's a little bit of forgiveness there, which in my mind provides an opportunity to impress, an opportunity to show polish, to show a little bit of professionalism where maybe it wasn't expected at first. So what I'm gonna share with you uh, right now is an outline that uh, will probably sound familiar to you because we learn a version of this in school. Uh, the original version we, we put out to the world in, in 1963 still is taught today uh, in universities all over the world and countries all over the world. Uh, and this, so this structure you're about to learn is the structure you should, you should use to organize your presentation. When you're told you have to give one and you're sitting there and you're thinking, oh boy, where do I begin? And you don't begin with PowerPoint. You know, if we have time, we'll talk about that. But begin by thinking about the structure that you're about to you're about to hear and see. So on my screen, on your screen here, what I'll do is 
uh, let me just share my screen so you can see uh, these slides. It's very, very simple. If you have something to write with, then uh, please take notes. Uh, but it's simple enough, you may just be able to remember it. Okay, so this is what we call the four-step outline. That's what we call it, nice and simple. It has four steps. Step number one has three words. Tell what tell. That's the first thing that you're going to tell your listeners is what you're going to be talking about, what you're going to tell them. Under this step, this is where you include things like maybe how long are you going to be talking for? How many topics are you going to be talking about? If you, and if you have an agenda, not all presentations use an agenda. It's a good idea. It's a good technique. It's one technique. But if you have it, this is where that would go. Uh, any other special instructions that you have for people? That's the first thing that you do. You get to talk about these things. In a half an hour presentation, this might only be a minute or two. It's not long. It's very simple, very easy. It also means you need to know what you're going to talk about. All right, step number two, you saw it for a brief moment there, has three words. Tell, why listen? This is a brief comment as to why they should listen to this presentation. It's not necessarily why they should believe you or like you or, or buy what you're selling them or whatever it is, but who cares that you're talking about this topic? Why should they hear it? And you know, what's fascinating is that we found is that even when listeners know why they should be uh, listening, when the speaker and the research that we've conducted around this, when the speaker says it out loud, it just engages the, the thinking in the back of the mind. It pulls people in. I'm in the right place for the right time, at, for the right reason. Uh, even if I don't like what you have to say. And I'm going to give you an example of this in just a minute. But that's the second step. It's usually just a comment. It's very simple. You got to think about, you put yourself in their shoes. It's not always easy to come up with. Uh, one thing's for sure. If you can't figure out why they should listen to this topic, how are they going to figure it out? All right, step number three has one word, tell. This is the body of your presentation. This is where most of your time is going to be spent. Uh, in many presentations, all four of these steps repeat again and again and again and again inside of step three. Each topic that you're going to talk about, you can apply the four-step outline to each topic. And when you do, it makes you incredibly well-structured. Even if you're a nervous wreck and people can see it visibly, if you get, if experience nervousness and they know it, we know that when people are structured, they can walk away and get the intended message. So in step three, we see all four steps, very simple. And then step number four has three words, tell what told. This is a brief uh, review of what you just talked about. You literally repeat yourself. Now, sometimes you say the exact words, sometimes it's not. Sometimes you just make a reference to the general topic that you just talked about. It's gonna be on a case by case basis based on who you're presenting to. But you, you come back and tie back to your key points. Not everything, just the key points, the most important points that you need them to have. There's another part of, a, of, a, of step four. Where, this is a summary. This, there's another part, summaries of two parts. The first part is what I just said, that most important points, you repeat yourself. The second part is that you, you say an action statement when it applies. What do you want your listeners to do now that they know this information? Do you want them to go somewhere, call somebody, think about, I mean, soft actions like think about or consider, keep in mind, right? What, what should they do now that they know this information? And that's it. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them why they should listen. Tell them. Tell them what you told them. Very, very easy. Now, often in high school and, and even at the college level, we learn about steps one, three, and four, introduction, body, conclusion. Step two is probably the secret sauce in a presentation. It is the engaging component. All right, let me give you an example of this. Uh, I'll open it up to the group. You can unmute. I'd like someone to throw out a topic any topic in the world, it doesn't matter. You can just unmute and call it out. And then I'll use that to demonstrate this four-step outline for you. Hi, 
Hi, how about interning during coronavirus times? <laughs> All right. Interning during coronavirus. All right. See if you can follow the four steps as I go through this presentation. Okay. Give me a sec. Okay, so today I'm going to be talking with you about interning during the coronavirus. And this is going to be helpful for you because if you're looking to get the most out of your internship and maybe even get a job from that, uh, this is going to help you maximize your chances to do that. And then for some of you who maybe already have a job, you don't care about that, uh, maybe you'll be talking with some friends who are interning and looking for it. These are some tips that you can give to them as well. There are two basic things you got to keep in mind during interning as a, during coronavirus. Number one, you don't have the normal face-to-face uh, -face communication that builds relationships and bonds that you would have if you were live in the meeting. So that means you may need to work a little harder to stay communicated with people. The second thing, number two, is that uh, you want to be make sure that you in, inject moments where you can have breaks throughout the day. If you go meeting to meeting to meeting by three or four o'clock, you'll have what's called, what's known, the psychologists were referring to as screen fatigue. And then the ability to be effective at, that, at those meetings and when you're presenting is very diminished. So keep these two things in mind. A little extra communication because you're not there live and put breaks in throughout the day. If you keep these two things in mind, you're gonna do just fine during your internship and maybe even get that job or help your friend get that job. All right, I'll time out. <laughs> now I'm just making stuff up here, but could you hear the steps, the structure? Okay, that's, that's it. Now in my example, uh, the step number two, in this example, I actually had two step twos. And now this is, I did this on purpose. This is a common thing. Sometimes when you're at a meeting and you're presenting as an intern, maybe you're presenting to somebody, I'm just gonna make, a, make it up. Maybe you're presenting to the leadership of prod, product management. <sighs> Uh, but at the same time, maybe you have some people from finance in the room and somebody's asked you to do some research project and your step one, over the next 30 minutes, I'm going to be sharing with you the research, uh, the market research that we did in the, in the past month. There's one. Now, step two, I've got two different groups in the room. So I got to really think about that for a minute. Uh, now, here's the first group, the project, project management. Uh, this is going to be helpful for those of you who are uh, looking to make decisions on which logo is going to look the best for the product when you put it on the website. I know we have, and then here comes the second one. I know we have people from finance in the room. This is going to help you maybe have a little more insight when product management comes over to you asking for a little more money for the project. At least you'll know what they're talking about. All right, now I'm making this up here, but what you want to do is put yourself into the state of mind. Put yourself into the mind of those listeners. And ask yourself this question, who cares? Why do I have to listen to this? Who cares? Don't assume it. You say it out loud, you are going to engage them right away. And that's the four-step outline. Tell them what you're going to tell them. Tell them why they should listen. Tell them, tell them what you told them. It's very, very simple. Now, uh, be I don't want to, before I go on to, I want to teach a second a tool here. But before I do do that, are there questions, thoughts, comments, or concerns uh, about this particular structure in a presentation or how to approach it or other questions related to presenting? I have a question just as we shift virtual, a few of us were talking about this before the event started, but um, in coronavirus times or remote times, do you find it to be um, more helpful uh, or the same to be when you know when you are presenting in a meeting to have slides or do you think it's better you know get rid of the slides taking up the screen and try to keep the face to face and the Brady Bunch boxes open as much as possible have you found one thing to be more effective over the other yeah it's an important question it, it, it some of the things that we know as best practices are now exaggerated uh, during COVID uh, because of the um, the virtual setting uh, personally, I'm a minimalist with slides. Uh, I'm not a big fan. I, it, it, what used well, they're very effective. Used poorly, they can prevent messages from getting through. Because what happens is the, the think of it like this, think of it like this. In, in general American English, we speak at a rate of approximately 183 words per minute. 
we can think at, four, at 600 words per minute. So we have about 400 or so words a minute doing other things. When I'm watching and listening to somebody give a presentation, that 400 words a minute back here, I am seeing things and I am hearing things and I am mapping them together. If they are not together, if they are out of sync, it's like watching television or a movie where the video and audio is out of sync. You can do it, but it's a lot of effort. So that means the burden is on the speaker to be as close to synchronized as possible. So that what that means is you don't want your listeners to see a, a visual until you say it or after. So if I put up a slide with all the bullets all at one time, it makes it a tremendous amount of effort for a listener to read that because they'll read it. They can and they will. <laughs> and they can read faster than you can talk. So it puts you out of sync. And th this way we barely even hear what the speaker said. So that's why we animate or build slides one bullet at a time. Now, there are some people who, who hate that. <laughs> they don't like the slides animated at all. Usually it's because we're taking too long to get to a particular point. Um, but on, now on Zoom or Teams or whatever the tool, it's become exaggerated because the slide in many cases, depending on the technology, takes over the whole screen. And the speaker's now a tiny little box. And all this print is in your face. So you want to be very, very aware of who is looking at what and when. To the best, we're not going to be perfect. We're not going to get perfect with this. We can get pretty effective with it. You saw me a moment ago. I started with no slides on purpose. I didn't want you to see my slides until I wanted to. You even saw me make a mistake. I brought up step two too early. Okay, so I took it away. Big deal. It's not about surprising you with what it says. It's about when I am talking about it, that's when I want you to see it at the same time, then I'm synchronized. But I would not start, a lot of folks, what happens is we, we say, oh, I got to do a presentation. Okay. And we open PowerPoint. And then we say, okay, well, the first thing I'll talk about is this. And then that's a bullet point. Then I'll talk about this. And that's a bullet point. And then this. And that's a bullet. The next thing you know, every single thing I'm going to say orally is now printed, which is a different medium of communicating. So you want to be selective with that stuff. I, I, it's, it's hard to then go back and remove it from the slide because somewhere in our mind, we think that means we're not going to cover it. Not true. It just means we may not project it. So you, sometimes it's, it's really helpful to start in Microsoft Word on a whiteboard and map out using the four-step outline. Say, look, here's what I'm going to, here are the points I'm going to cover. And then here's how I'll put them into the four-step outline. So I'm just, I know I sort of took it in a few different directions for you here, but uh, these, you, you, sparked some, you sparked some good, uh, good topics that often come up around this. You, as people are thinking about another question that you want to ask, I'll, I'll share one more thought about this four step while it's fresh in my mind, is when it comes time to practice, and you should practice, don't just think about what you're going to say, practice out loud. You time yourself. And what a good technique, we teach this to CEOs all over the world. A good technique is as you're practicing, each section of your talk, each little mini four-step outline, stop and then write down how long it took for that section alone. And then keep going and then do the next one. And in your notes on a piece of paper or wherever you take notes, you should see like not just the full 30 minutes, but this was seven minutes. This was two and a half minutes. This was eight minutes. This is a very effective technique. Number one, it makes, it helps you familiarize, not memorize, but familiarize yourself with your talk. Number two, it really helps you in those times when you show up to the meeting and they told you, oh, we said a half an hour, uh, you have 15 minutes, which happens all the time. If you know how long each section is, you don't have to panic. You can just say, okay, sure. Uh, well, coming in today, I had five topics. And the time we have, here are the five topics, and maybe those are on the screen. You say, I'm going to cover the first two, or one and four, or whatever it is. Instantly, you can edit and not have to feel like you have to quickly rush through and quickly get through it, in which case people get nothing. So I'll open up to any other questions. I'll, I'll keep taking these and just teach to them. I guess I'll ask one. Um, okay. 
Uh, do you have any recommendations, let's say, to slip in jokes in a presentation when doing it online now in order to entertain people, keep them engaged? <laughs> Yeah, jokes. The, the, the general rule, I, I appreciate that question. Uh, that's a common one. And the general rule with humor is you can do humor if you can do humor. If it's comfortable for you, go for it. Now, it is contextual. So you've got to think about who your listeners are. Uh, uh, Brianne, I think, was saying the same thing when it comes to like LinkedIn, and you got to know who your people are that are reading that, who's your target. In a presentation, know who's in the room uh, and just be careful with that. You know, a lot of folks have been reporting uh, it's difficult with humor through Zoom and similar technologies because we say the joke and then <laughs> crickets because we can't hear anybody and it can be very uncomfortable for the speaker. So just be a little bit sensitive to that. Uh, if you're not sure, test it with a peer or a colleague. And when you're testing it, you want to tell that friend, say, look, you're this kind of a person. Let me know if you think that would be funny or not. Uh, now, inside of the business world, you may ask people who know, if you're presenting in this, the senior vice presidents in the room, you could ask people who know that person. Uh, strategically over time, you want to get to know that person. Sometimes we ask them directly before the presentation. We say, hey, look, I'm working. Interns have this wonderful free card, which is I'm learning and developing myself. <laughs> and most VPs that we work with, and we work with a lot, uh, they love it when people reach out to them asking for advice and mentoring, maybe not in the meeting, but before. Maybe you're presenting next week. You might go to someone and say, hey, I'm presenting next week. I want to make sure I do a good job with this. How do you, how would you say if I, how would you feel if I took this approach? You'll get great feedback and build a relationship with someone who might even hire you in the future. So just some things to keep in mind with that. Some of you may have noticed when I asked for questions and then I just sat silent. It's uncomfortable sometimes to sit silent. Uh, in general, Oh, you'll find out with speech coaches, you, we're quite comfortable with silence. We train with it. Uh, there are a lot of reasons why in general, we're not, people in general are not comfortable with silence. Television is, pro is probably the biggest culprit because in television, there is no silence. Uh, your favorite TV show, even when people are not talking, you hear sound effects or music. But then in a presentation, when there's silence, we get very uncomfortable. In a Zoom call, in a conference call, uh, this type of technology, you need, typically you need to stay silent longer than you would in the physical room. Are there any guesses as to how much time you should allow to pass before you continue to talk after you have asked a question? Two minutes. <laughs> it, it feels like I did that, didn't it? Uh, about 16 to 18 seconds. And that's ex in fact, that's exactly what happened with the first question. I was just about to start talking again right at 18 seconds, and we, and we got the question that came out. The second time, it happened around 12. But here's the psychology around this, what happens. You ask the question. I mean, think about it. Participants, everybody's alone in their room, in their home, in their office, by themselves, with a screen. So the speaker asks a question. The first, for many people, the first thought is, oh, sit back now, not me. After about six, to, after about uh, eight to eight, eight or nine seconds of silence, uh, the participants start thinking, oh, he's serious. Oh, he actually wants participation. Now people begin to think about a question. At about 12 seconds in, questions start popping up into our mind, but now it's been so quiet, I don't feel like maybe I shouldn't, someone else is about to go. And at about 16 to 18 seconds, somebody unmutes and says hello. So if you're doing a meeting and you're hoping for interactivity and not getting it, it's possible that you're not allowing enough silence uh, to go through uh, after you ask a question. It's an important one. Other thoughts, comments, or questions or concerns about speaking, things I did talk about or did not talk about? And just to be sensitive, we had like, what, two minutes left, right, I think, just to be sensitive to everyone's time. Uh, I have a quick question. It's a, sort of about jargon and acronyms. 
If you're presenting to a very mixed group of people with different technical skills, do you have any recommendations for trying to add in definitions to acronyms? Because you don't want to say really long things over and over in a presentation. Um, so any, any best practices for adding in definitions and things like that? Uh, yeah, I, I really like this question. It's overlooked a lot. Uh, one of my favorite is, uh, is CRM. And I remember uh, one, of our, one of our clients for many years is a, a company uh, out in Marlboro called Boston Scientific. And <laughs> most folks in the, in the high tech world, CRM is customer relationship management, not at BSC. CRM is cardio rhythm management. <laughs> And I sat in a meeting one time and watched two different people use the same acronym with completely different understandings of the, it was so funny, actually. But, you know, that aside, there's another reason that we need to be sensitive to acronyms and abbreviations. It has to do with, this is very nerdy, but articulation and clarity of sound. I might know exactly what an acronym means. But if I'm not used to your speech pattern, I don't exactly know what you said. Uh, a common example would be uh, ADP, the number 8080P, ADP. Well, ADP, if you sound it out, is also letters, the letter A, the letter D, and the letter P. And folks in, in particular, one year we were training some folks in sales from ADP, and they were like, I hate when they ask us what the number stands for. It's like, yeah, because you need to be more articulate when you say a company name. What's happening there is a technical term in speech communication called assimilation. It's the combining of sounds. We say wanna instead of want to, gimme instead of give me. And when I'm doing that with someone who knows me well, who cares? Doesn't matter. But when I'm talking with people from another department, from outside of the company, I need to be clear in particular, and to, to Ava's point, maybe in the first one, two, or three times maybe that you say the term, I would, if it's an abbreviation, I would actually say it. Customer Relationship Management, CRM, and then continue. And I'd say it's slow, and it may feel silly, but your listeners will be with you. And they will, they're not going to be like, she was so helpful to me. It's just, I'm with you. I am, you didn't lose me. So, but you have to practice it because it feels weird saying it a little slower. At least once, depending on who your listeners are, maybe you do it a second time and a third. And after that, you don't need to anymore. You have now trained them during that presentation, your speech pattern. So great question, often overlooked. Oh, we're out of time. So with that, <laughs> Uh, I want to be sensitive and not go, not go over for folks. So if you uh, need to reach me, uh, speechimprovement.com is the website. Definitely you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, I think you saw you know, my email, ethan at speechimprovement.com. If you have questions about this stuff, let, let me know. Feel free to reach out. There's a whole team of us here and we're happy to help. Uh, we're not a law firm. We don't flip the meter on if somebody reaches out for questions. We're just going to, we'll just, we'll just answer you and help you out. So. With that said, I will turn it back over to Mackenzie. Thanks for having me. Great, thank you so much, Ethan. It's always oh. helpful, no matter how many times I hear you. I, I pick up one or two new things each time, so that was great. Um, so this concludes the workshop part of today's program. Um, like I mentioned, we um, have the opportunity for virtual speed networking if anyone would like to do that. So I'm putting in the chat the link for that um, because it's hosted in a platform called Hopin, just a browser works best in Google Chrome is what we hear from other people. Um, so if anyone would like to attend that, it's open until five, just put the link in your browser. Um, you may just need to sign up for an account if you haven't been in there for previous sessions. Um, when you're using that, you know, when you get into the welcome area, it will just tell you how to navigate it. You go into the networking room, enable your audio and video. That way if you're matched with someone, they can hear and see you. Um, you'll be set up for four minute conversations. If you are both enjoying the conversation and both hit the connect button, um, you'll be able to share your information with each other, which will be stored in your Hopin account for further um, connections. 
that's really it. And then, you know, if you move over there, you just can't have Zoom running at the same time because Zoom will be trying to pick up your audio and video. So I'll leave this open for a few minutes just so nobody loses that link. It is in the, the chat there. So you can just paste that into a browser. Um, thank you so much for joining. The recording will be available. I'll look to speakers to get slides to be able to share those out as a reference for people if you have friends or colleagues that missed today's session. And thank you for joining us. Thanks to all our speakers. Thanks, Mackenzie. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Mackenzie. Thank you.